As we ask our second panel to come up, I do want to recognize we have a few other elected colleagues who have joined us, and that would include Councilman uh, Mark Levine and Councilwoman Barbara Heller from San Rafael, and also Councilmember Sean Marshall from Mill Valley. We thank you for being here. Thank you, Supervisors. Thank you for being here. Mr. Clanna, just because there may be so many issues raised, I'm going to ask if we might save you for last. All right. And if we um, have any, you can welcome to take it as you, Mr. Supervisor McGlashan. Senator, thank you very much for convening this special hearing today. Um, I'm Supervisor Charles McGlashan, and I serve as chairman of the Marin Energy Authority. And your first question asked how long uh, we've been involved with this. And in my case, I got involved eight years ago, immediately after the law was passed. Advocates <coughs> brought this to my attention even before I was a board member of the Marin Water District. The water districts in Marin County partnered with the County Board of Supervisors to help fund the initial feasibility study and when that was completed in 2005, it occurred to all of us that the community choice aggregation law that the legislature created may in fact provide the most powerful tool available to any local government, perhaps any government at any level, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by rapidly converting our consumption of electric power to renewable sources. In Marin County, as the years have gone by and we've looked and re-looked and peer-reviewed our initial analysis, it's become clear to us that the half a million tons of reduction available in our small community every year from utilization of the Community Choice Aggregation Law is at least 50 times larger than the next best available strategy to local government. From transportation policy, the smart rail is the second largest thing I've worked on in eight years, and that's worth about 25,000 tons a year. Community choice aggregation fully implemented in Marin County, just within the cities that decided to remain members, that's worth over half a million tons a year. This is an, an extraordinarily powerful opportunity that has been virtually destroyed by the antics of PG&E. Do you know where this uh, determination, and I'm looking at a letter that was written to Ms. Weiss by uh, Christopher Warner from PG&E, stating that the MEA's program agreement, number one, will increase greenhouse gas emissions attributable to energy usage in Marin by as much as 518,000 metric tons from 2010 to 2015. And they based the statement on an analysis by Dr. Joe Nation. <laughs> the information in that letter is both flawed and deliberately misleading. It was based on an assumption that the Marin Energy Authority would only contract for the 25% minimum threshold of renewable power that the RPS standard we chose would indicate and substituted everything else for fossil power, i.e. their use of natural gas. We stated repeatedly for the last five years that that was not going to be our strategy, and as Director Wise pointed out, we're now 78% non-fossil and 26% renewable. So there was the gain through the eight-year process that we experienced here in Marin was to destroy the scale of the opportunity to convince cities to leave and then ultimately to scare ratepayers out of the program as Director Wise and Mr. Orth indicated to you. And it was a very explicit, sort of baldly admitted strategy. In various closed session meetings that PG&E executives held with my colleagues, meetings to which I was not invited, certain things were said such as it will be cheaper to bury you with marketing than it would be to pursue litigation over CEQA. And that explicit statement was made to my colleague, Supervisor Steve Kinsey, in reference to their decision in December of 2009 to commence early their marketing barrage to the citizens of Marin to scare them out of the And who made that statement? Uh, Nancy, uh, Nancy McFadden. 
So the executives that have already spoken today, today did a very good job of identifying the technical realities and the explicit technical efforts that PG&E went through to try to destroy the effort here uh, in Marin, San Francisco, and in um, southern San Joaquin County. And as you can tell, I think Renata Brillinger raised the theme that I most want to emphasize in my brief comments here, that that has had an extraordinarily chilling effect for political leaders throughout the state of California to ever embark on such an exercise. The business of politics is a rough sport, and I recognize that. But the unique reputation destruction that I and my colleagues have experienced in Marin goes beyond what is reasonable to expect a city council member or a county supervisor to face in the world of local politics. I find, and I'm not here to be a diplomat today, I find it absolutely outrageous that a monopoly protected under state law is allowed to engage in deliberately misleading and false marketing activities, as Don Wise very carefully explicated today. It's outrageous that those techniques can be used to manipulate a local grand jury, that those can be used to send deliberately false pieces to residents whom I represent, indicating a lack of responsibility that a local government official like me and our other board members want to undertake for the sake of preserving the environment in the face of climate change. You asked David Orth about his motives in doing it down south, and ours were slightly different. We saw this, as I mentioned, as an extraordinary opportunity to cut greenhouse gas. We also saw it as an opportunity to use private sector funding, not taxpayer revenue, not taxpayer resources, but private sector resources loaned and secured through the agency's cash flow to drive renewable energy investments into our local economy and to drive energy efficiency investments into our local economy in a way that would benefit local job creation. We also, as you know, uh, set a standard for ourselves that we, had, we would accomplish all of these things with competitive rates that would be either at or below or very similar to the rates that PG&E would charge over time. Their rates are now different from ours because they immediately moved them in June this past summer, but our customers enjoy competitive rates and these local short and long-term benefits. In the short term, even if the Marin Energy Authority never did anything other than buy electric power from the existing marketplace, that's good for the California economy. By giving generators that can't or won't sell their resources to the IOUs another buyer to sell to, in the form of us or San Francisco or other community choice aggregators, we provide a new buyer against a monopoly power situation. All of these publicly declared motives that date back to 2003, when I first started talking about this idea, were met with a skillfully executed misinformation campaign that was de designed to destroy my reputation and the reputation of 55 members of city councils throughout this county who would deign to take the bold step of supporting this crazy idea. And I resent it. It also has made it very difficult to identify any other politician in any other county that's willing to pay that kind of personal price. I'm not here today to try to be a crybaby about this, but the reality is that the law that the legislature set out with the intent of creating price competition or opportunity competition or economic opportunity has been so badly abused through the inability to regulate the behavior of this utility that it's unlikely or very difficult to imagine other leaders stepping forward to take on that kind of abuse. I only do it because I'm hell-bent on answering the children's question about climate change. If I wasn't so determined to do that, I wouldn't have withstood the pounding either. And it's a lot to ask of local leaders. So I guess the first thing I'd say to quickly try to run through the question about what would you do differently I think the prior panel did a great job of saying the technical changes that might be needed in the law or its enforcement 
or in regulatory oversight by the Public Utilities Commission, my first piece of advice would be that the Commission needs to be empowered to make it absolutely illegal for pg e to manipulate marketing through call centers, proactive outreach to rate payers. They need to be forced to cooperate fully as your original law intended. That needs to be cleared up and it will have to unfortunately be spelled out explicitly in advance. We are spending hundreds of thousands of dollars fighting a legal battle thanks to Dan and others uh, legal support that we have, our ratepayers are paying the price of trying to sort out and define these um, legal boundaries as we go along in implementing our service. Don Wise mentioned that staff time, money, ratepayer resources, and bank loans are all being used to thwart the activities of a utility to mislead the public. As Don mentioned, we're still dealing with senior citizens who think their lights will go out if they don't opt out right. of the opportunity. And so that would be a critical first step. I'm going to be asking this of Mr. Clannon as well, but looking at page six of the original legislation of AB 117, section nine, all, electric, all electrical corporations shall cooperate fully with any community choice aggregators that investigate, pursue, or implement community choice aggregation programs. Is there ambiguity in that statement? We see no ambiguity whatsoever, and yet the behavior of the utility would indicate that either they don't understand the English language or that they willfully disobeyed that directive from the legislature. And it does even get more specific. Uh, continuous cooperation shall include all providing the entities with appropriate billing and electrical load data, which Ms. Wise addressed in her comments, including but not limited to data detailing electricity needs and patterns of usage as determined by the commission and in accordance with procedures established by the commission. So it is rather specific. It needs very little comment. It's okay. extremely clear and very specific. And if the commissioners were empowered to enforce that law, perhaps with some backup from the legislature again to make it abundantly clear that you meant it the first time, that may indeed help other leaders. One thing that I have indicated when asked to speak about this matter is that jurisdictions can't pursue community choice aggregation without elected leadership. It's become clear as Oakland failed to continue, Emeryville, Berkeley, many of the uh, Chula Vista. The other uh, jurisdictions that were well ahead of Marin County ultimately fell by the wayside because they didn't have that kind of leadership. And the problem is, is that until that clarity is reinforced <coughs> or actually enforced with some meaningful penalties or sanctions, it's very difficult to imagine that any politician wants to step up to the kind of abuse that we've had here in Marin County. And again, I, I don't want to make this about me personally, but the fact is, is it will be very hard to find other communities that would be able to provide the economic horsepower in their local jurisdictions, the rate security that San Joaquin County was looking for, or the greenhouse gas reductions, which I would argue is frankly the most important thing our generation faces. It's going to be very hard to find a politician that wants to bet their job on the kind of misleading market marketing and abusive tactics that we experienced here in Marin. And it breaks my heart on behalf of my own citizens and ratepayers that so many people were misled into believing that this was a risky scheme and Joe Nation was the architect of that strategy. And so PG&E has the right to hire people, pay them extraordinary billing rates, to deploy a bunch of hired guns that legally are allowed to say completely erroneous and misleading bits of information. Things that Don Wise, Sean Marshall, our vice chair, and other city council members of our board had to spend hours and hours and hours of time in public venues like this trying to correct the record. It would be very nice if the explicit details of the implementation plan were the debate items about participation among cities or participation among ratepayers. And that wasn't the case for us. It was a colossal waste of time and energy in this area. Well, as we move on, let me thank you, Supervisor, on behalf of the entire legislature, which enacted AB 117, for your leadership and risks in the implementation of 
the very idea and concept of community choice aggregation. I know you've been through a lot, and I've been thrilled personally to see your success unfold, but I know you have a hardworking board and uh, great leadership in Director Wise as well. So it's been a success story. It's been a pleasure to watch unfold. I would do it again. I would do it again, but reluctantly. If it, <laughs> if it wasn't for Don Wise, we wouldn't be here today. If it wasn't for my colleagues who had the courage to stand up in the face of withering abuse, we And all the city council today. members who took those votes as well. Indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Supervisor Mercurini, welcome to Murray County. Uh, Senator Leno, thank you very much. Senator Leno, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for uh, calling this hearing. Uh, it's an honor to be here with uh, so many uh, distinguished members uh, of both uh, city government uh, and of our advocacy for this particular issue. And I was certainly um, delighted to hear the commentary from the first panel as well. <clears throat> Uh, long before I was uh, elected uh, to office, uh, I had a number of experiences in working with and against uh, PG&E with regard to uh, advancing the notion of public power in San Francisco. San Francisco is home to uh, probably some of the most legendary fights uh, between uh, advocates who would like to realize the dream that was bequeathed to us by Congress uh, in us owning Hetch Hetchy uh, and through the Raker Act, established in the early part of the 20th century, that we should be able to chart our own energy destiny. Uh, in some very, very uh, well-fought campaigns that PG&E typically would outspend us uh, exponentially to one, uh, it uh, certainly helped season my understanding of what it meant uh, to take on a corporation that really was, uh, in my opinion, unregulated or unbridled in their ability to spend uh, any amount of money that it took in order to reign control uh, of their monopoly in San Francisco and certainly throughout their service territory. Uh, one of those campaigns led to the creation of LAFCO, uh, Local Agency Formation Commission, which you, Supervisor, then, uh, and your colleagues uh, created the last LAFCO in the state of California, uh, which was established in the city and county of San Francisco. When I became elected to office, I became the chair of LAFCO, and we tried to then pursue uh, the actualization of the dream of Assembly Bill 117, which we have remained steadfast on. Uh, we have uh, consistently have been trying to uh, put into place the building blocks of what it would mean to share the service territory uh, of PG&E not engage in the eviction as to what some would see as a public power uh, objective, but literally just want to have a seat at the table because many of us believe in the elected family, as well as many, I think, throughout the city and county of San Francisco, that it's time that we also answer the call from a municipal perspective on how we can step up to the plate to certainly do our part in addressing uh, climate change and trying to uh, insert and integrate a diversified energy portfolio of clean, green energy that allows us in a more vigorous way to chart our own energy destiny, whether it be solarization, whether it be wind, whether it be tidal wave, energy efficiency, or conservation. The people in the city and county of San Francisco, and many of us within the elected family, high majority, are sincere and determined to try to deliver on this particular goal. Uh, along the course of our way of trying to pursue the uh, enactment of AB 117, uh, we have seen how PG&E uh, has uh, mimicked the same kind of tactics in San Francisco as they have in other jurisdictions around the state. Um, for lack of better phrase or characterization, they are assassins. They are simply, uh, I think, uh, focused on doing everything they possibly can to make sure that they uh, continue, I think, their uh, complete monopoly at all, at all cost. Uh, and they are unregulated from their ability to really spend that level of money, both directly and indirectly, uh, to make that happen. The terrorist, uh, I think, or harassing type uh, maneuvers that we saw take place in San Joaquin County uh, and other jurisdictions was a precursor of what we thought 
uh, we would expect in San Francisco. We had also had hoped along the course of the way uh, of when there would be raining disinformation by well-spent campaigns by PG&E to the people of either San Joaquin County or in other jurisdictions who were also on pace to establish a CCA, that we would have seen the intervention by the CPUC and or the state to message to uh, PG&E uh, that they were uh, violating the spirit and literally uh, the letter of the law of Assembly, one, Assembly Bill 117. That didn't happen. So we were not surprised by the time that when other jurisdictions begin to cave in, drop off, or just be completely beleaguered because they were not able to muscle the litigation resources or the political resources financially and the political wherewithal to stave off that level of attack by PG&E, then it came to our front door of the few remaining county and city jurisdictions in California, making Marin and San Francisco really practically uh, brothers and sisters in arms. Uh, this is where I certainly have uh, enjoyed our uh, uh, relationship in evolving relationship with uh, Supervisor McLashen and others here in Marin, and uh, just absolutely honored and privileged to see the hardworking uh, people, both in the elected family up here in Marin County, um, and the staff and the advocates who have rallied around in the most savvy and smart way uh, to fend off the pg and tactics. We would share what we knew of what we would expect because we are no stranger to these tactics in San Francisco, and yet we certainly had seen uh, even uh, new inventions by pg and &E to try to subvert the good work that they're doing up here. Luckily, I don't think that all politicians um, are necessarily caving in uh, because we were able to see a resurgence of force that spoke up and spoke smartly against PG&E's what I thought arrogant tactic of Proposition 16 last June. Uh, I can't tell you how proud I am of the California electorate and of the many cities and county governments who stood tall with an unprecedented collection of resolutions by elected officials that we were able to uh, really uh, pin together very quickly to express in the strongest statement that Proposition 16 was once again a step over the line in the most egregious way that PG&E could effectuate. Uh, it was that uh, strategy, along with us getting to newspapers and others, uh, that was uh, enabling us to deliver a defeat of Prop 16, considering that PG&E spent approximately $50 million to our 150000 and that was a record unto itself, but there are elected officials who I believe throughout uh, the state of California, especially in the service territory of PG&E, where they lost commandingly uh, in their own service territory because we're tired of the thuggery. We're tired of being bullied. We're tired of the fact that when we're trying to explain the natural dynamic that what community choice aggregation is or even in cousin to public power is that by law we're not for profit. We're a non-for-profit uh, for construct that is uh, required to then fend off against a for-profit monopoly driven uh, or objective for monopoly driven company and then try in an arena to be able to explain our story to the general public who often gets tired or confused or fatigued simply because of the disinformation that is then being generated in excessive amounts to the point where people just tune out or turn off uh, because that is the campaign tactic of PG&E, even to those who might lean in our direction of trying to give municipal governments a leg up uh, so that we have something to offer. CPUC, I think, has had opportunity and the state opportunity to intercede and intervene at different milestones on behalf of different cities and counties, Marin and on San Francisco along the way. Sometimes I sit back and wonder, is it the absence of law or teeth in law that doesn't give the CPUC and other state regulatory bodies the ability to see clearly where their position is so that they can, I think, with great lucidity, be able to then insert, I think, where they think is the proper way? Or is it a lack of political will? I'm afraid to think that it's sometimes a combination of both, if not more of the latter. However, though, I think to the course of this particular uh, discussion forum today, I'd like to offer some suggestions 
uh, that might, at least in more practical terms, be more fair and honest in the playing field of what it will take for cities like ours to flourish as a CCA and hopefully to reignite and allow others to reimagine what it means in a more honest landscape of what it will take in order to instigate a CCA. First, um, I'd like there to be consideration that <clears throat> uh, there will be uh, complete uh, prevention of PG&E from shifting uh, the generation cost to transmission and distribution costs. As the law stands right now, uh, PG&E has that ability to basically uh, portray their own sort of shell game as to where uh, the costs are coming from and them allowing to take advantage uh, of the fact that they would be able to beat our particular costs when by law we are somewhat saddled to the objective of not just trying to meet or beat but even be that much more transparent of giving a better product if that product certainly exceeds the cost of PG&E which in my opinion is an inferior product uh, to begin with. Uh, next, uh, certainly trailing on some of the great comments of the first panel, uh, I uh, agree that uh, PG&E uh, has managed to convince the P CPUC uh, that because the duty of full cooperation does not specifically uh, uh, prohibit anti-CCA marketing, uh, the legislature intended to allow utilities to engage in this behavior, that needs to be clarified that they are not allowed and that there must be penalties attached to make sure that, CC, that CCA is not misinterpreted in the way AB 117 uh, has been written. To leave no doubt on this issue, AB 117 should be amended to make clear that the duty of full cooperation prohibits utilities from, at minimum, one, engaging in anti-CCA marketing, two, soliciting opt-outs, and three, using utility employees to market against CCA programs. The unions, of course, and IBEW 1245 and Local 6 have also been used to deploy in some of the muscling of against anti-CCA activities. In lieu of expensive marketing wars in which CCAs are forced to use their limited resources to try to respond to attacks by utilities, thereby driving up the cost to serve customers, which we are then responsible for in draining down our own public treasuries to fend off against these aggressive tactics by PG&E does not provide for us the kind of what we would have expected, a level of support by the state and or the double jeopardy of us trying to explain to a citizenry why are we spending money against our even hometown, homegrown a utility company who's then sending messages in particular to minority communities which is their specialty tactic to get into African American, Latino, Chinese and Asian American communities and other communities, multilingual communities to then try to taint the very image of what we are trying to do in certainly in the most sincere and genuine way of providing an alternative to what PG&E uh, provides them. Supervisor, since we have limited time I wanted to ask if you could uh, briefly in closing uh, give us any further update in addition to the report that we heard from Clean Power SF regarding your efforts and your colleagues' efforts in establishing <coughs> community choice aggregation in San Francisco County. Well, uh, thank you. And I'll submit the rest of my comments in writing because there are other uh, suggestions we have, I think, for the consideration of legislation uh, or amending legislation. And thank you for that. Uh, we are uh, just now in uh, receipt of uh, answers to our uh, bids, uh, request for proposal, uh, by uh, several companies. And we had started over this process uh, uh, several months ago uh, because we did not uh, and were not able to uh, enlist the bids that we were hoping for uh, earlier this year uh, for CCA in San Francisco. Luckily, uh, we had, in my opinion, bought time, uh, but I don't think that's time that PG is going to allow indefinitely by us beating back Proposition 16 uh, so that we were able to uh, cast a call for requests for proposals again. Uh, as the first panel uh, where it had been mentioned, uh, a number of strong companies have now uh, signaled their interest in San Francisco CCA. Uh, next week through LAFCO, 
uh, and then through the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, we'll be embarking on hearings in the vetting of those uh, particular contracts. Uh, Nancy Miller, who's the chief executive of LAFCO, along with SFPUC staff, uh, will begin to make their staff reports to us as to where they think uh, are the best candidates of that lot. It is my goal as chair of LAFCO uh, to make sure that by 2011 uh, we have a clear answer into the direction of where San Francisco is going to go in CCA so that you have another ribbon cutting to go to. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here, Supervisor, Pleasure. and all your hard work on this. I know it's been a many year process for you and getting close to the end. Thank you. Ms. Miller, welcome. Yes, thank you. This is on. You can hear me, can yes. you? I'm going to be relatively brief because in the interest of time. Um, uh, in San Francisco, as has been previously mentioned by your, your, the former panel, um, some of the issues that we need help, quite frankly, through legislation have to do with the um, processing of and, and establishment of a CCA because a number of, as you heard before, a number of issues simply weren't vetted and so each um, agency or each uh, entity that's trying to create a CCA has had to uh, dedicate numerous resources, significant resources, to just simply f figuring out the implementation plan, their service agreement with PG&E, answer a whole lot of questions that, that about how to set up such a program. So I think in terms of legislation, the, the service agreement with PG&E, which is required to be on file with CPUC before you can um, actually begin your CCA program, there should be a standard service agreement. So each entity is not trying to negotiate its own. The current standard service agreement that is in place was, for, was, was uh, established prior to the CCA legislation, so it's not at all tailored to CCA. And many of the concerns and, and problems that you heard from the first panel having to do with customer contact, opt-out notices, billing sharing, sharing of customer information could all be handled in a standard service agreement between PG&E and the um, CCA, which is a requirement under the law. And to give the CPUC that authority to establish that and to require the investor-owned utility to share customer information and to actually cooperate with some teeth with penalties if they don't, I think is a very good idea and a good step forward in, in that process. Um, the second issue, which I believe was brought up by Supervisor McGreamy in your earlier panel, having to do with the issue of the uh, rates. And when a customer opens up their bill, and they're, they're trying to be able to decipher what they're being charged by whom. And it should be a standard um, uh, rate uh, or a standard billing sheet that could also be developed so that when you receive your bill and you open it up, just like all the utilities do, they try to make it simple and they try to make it very um, clear to a customer. And anyone that, that is in marketing or marketing with customers know that's, that's your key to your customer base, is that they understand what's being charged to them. Ms. Weiss testified that in the situation with the double billing and the confusion and the yes. billing, that PG&E's response was that it somehow was not technically able to do that. Well, I, I don't really think that that's the case. I, I mean, I've worked with PG&E. They have very good staff. When I worked with SMUD and they were dealing with an annexation, they, were, they have their information. They, these are customers that they want to retain. I believe that Ms. Weiss was talking about the bundled rate. It, it's fairly easy to unbundle that. And if it's not easy, they still need to do it anyway. It's kind of an issue where we understand competition is tough. And the playing field may even be uneven because of PG&E's resources, but we just like to get to the field. You know, we just like to be able to be there. And, and the problem is, given their resources and given that this is a brand new program, some of these issues I think we could, with legislation and CPUC's help, we could make it much easier for a city or a municipality <coughs> or a JPA to enter into that realm knowing that many things have been or are, are already standardized. Um, because it's hard enough to get into the get in the utility business, right? I, I mean, you are asking a lot of the local government, and, and many of them want to do it. And, and here, my third point, which is the, the partnership with PG&E, it makes a lot of sense for two reasons. At the local level, local level, they have a much greater ability to enact energy efficiency programs 
because every locality is different, energy efficiency programs are different. I believe it's harder for an investor-owned utility given their large um, uh, scale customer that, that the CCA could really be a wonderful way to do energy efficiency programs in conjunction with the large utility that's handling all the transmission distribution. So energy efficiency, which also gets you to your reduction of, of, of greenhouse gases, I believe legislation should be very clear that when a CCA uh, embarks or begins, the energy efficiency portion of the utility dollar that currently goes to PG&E should flow to the CCA. That's a very easy uh, piece of legislation. It would answer a lot of questions for a lot of us out here trying to uh, initiate CCA about where do those energy efficiency dollars go. Also on the PCIA, which Don talked about, there ought to be some clarity about exactly what that charge should be and should not be, or some direction provided to CPUC to uh, enter into that field, of, uh, because we believe that the charge is, is a bit high. Um, finally, this isn't really CCA, but since I have the floor and I've, I think I've got a couple <laughs> minutes left, I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, most public-owned utilities um, in, in um, mindful of greenhouse gas reduction, mindful of their customer base, will provide an incentive to their customers to do uh, local renewable um, uh, projects. Put solar on your house. Uh, put a, 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 you know, some sort of wind facility on top of your business. And if you generate excess energy, uh, more than you're using, they will actually buy it from you. PG&E will not do that. If you, if you put something on your house and you're generating excess uh, energy, you, do, you don't get any benefit of doing that. And I think that you could, with the legislature's help, um, pass legislation to require that because it is, in fact, um, would, the, the investor-owned utilities could get credit for that on their renew, renewable portfolio. And it just makes a whole lot of sense and it would encourage local renewable, which is another thing, instead of large solar, large wind farms all over the country, um, would do a lot towards um, pushing our energy platform forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Very much. <laughs> Mr. Douglas, before Mr. Flannon. Senator, thank Clean you. Up. Senator, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. And as Paul's going to be batting clean up here today, I'm going to also try to be brief, but uh, first of all, I just want to say that my firm is privileged to represent the Marin Energy Authority. Uh, we made a conscious philosophical decision many years ago that we would only represent parties who supported competitive markets. Needless to say, that means we don't represent utilities. It does mean that we are frequently on the opposite side of them, and we are particularly on the opposite side of pg and &E on any number of issues that pertain to the operations and the future success of the Marin Energy Authority. Uh, there were a couple of questions that were asked. I'm going to respond specifically to two, one in length and one very briefly. The first question was, as someone who works closely with a state regulatory agency, you know, what do you believe could be done to improve uh, the situation with the PUC? And I would first like to start my remarks by simply commending the PUC. I don't believe they have all the tools that they need uh, with regard to uh, community choice aggregation, but nevertheless, with the tools that they have, they have been doing an admirable job. Um, there has been, you have already quoted the provision from the statute that requires that all electrical corporations must cooperate fully with any community choice aggregator. There's a fundamental problem with that. It, yes, it's explicit. Yes, it's not vague. The problem is there's no teeth behind it. And the fact is that you need to have teeth in that provision. Uh, what we've seen is not the cooperation by the utility, but we've seen the antithesis of that. Uh, the, that provision of the law has clearly been far more observed in the breach than in the adherence, and something needs to be done about that. Specifically, I'd suggest two things. Number one, we need some sort of regular reporting and monitoring system by which proposed or existing CCAs would report to the commission on a regular basis with regard to the utility's performance in meeting or breaching that cooperation requirement. And the utility should have an opportunity to respond to those reports, and the commission should have the clear effort to investigate and take remedial action. 
What do I mean by remedial action? Well, among other things, um, we have a complaint proceeding procedure at the commission that allows someone like Marin to file a complaint against PG&E. And you asked Ms. Wise earlier as to why Marin had not. And one of the reasons, quite simply, is the cost and the extensive amount of time that it takes to do that. And as a result, um, Marin has been hesitant to do so. And one of the reasons for that, quite simply, is that it is so expensive to do so and there is no ability of the commission to award damages. So Marin could uh, make a absolutely persuasive and convincing, convincing presentation demonstrating the issues with what PG&E had done and the commission would be able, uh, would not be able to award any damages to Marin or any attorney's fees to Marin for what it incurred in trying to fight and contest the behavior by the utility. And that's really problematical. So uh, I would suggest that the statute does need to be modified to provide more teeth uh, along the lines that have just been suggested. Secondarily, a couple of parties have referred to the need for some sort of marketing code or a code of ethics. Uh, I think the statute should be modified to direct the PUC to develop such a code of ethics for uh, utility marketing efforts vis-a-vis -vis CCAs. I mean, for example, the, the fact that PG&E engaged phone banks to call every prospective customer in Marin makes a mockery of the full cooperation requirement. Um, we think also that there ought to be consideration given to a mandatory functional separation between the utility customer service activities, and by that I mean things like energy efficiency, uh, advice on tariff issues, participation in utility customer rebate programs, etc., with the competitive marketing activities, which ought to be both staffed and funded by non-regulated resources of the utility parent holding company and not funded and staffed by utility rate payers. There's also been a mention of the three-year return rule, and something needs to be done about that in the statute as well, because under current commission rules, uh, with regard, with a customer that returns to bundled utility service has to stay for at least three years before it can return to the CCA. This requirement either ought to be eliminated or shortened considerably. It was imposed years ago, originally in the context of direct access. And the justification, which I think was faulty then and remains faulty today, was nonetheless that, well, these are large customers, and when they return, uh, it could affect the utility's procurement planning. Uh, I don't think that justification holds any weight anyway, but even if it does, it certainly holds no weight when you're talking about residential direct access customers. <coughs> what the three-year rule has done is it effectively rewards a utility for anti-competitive activity engage in phone banks, send misleading mailers, get customers to opt out, and guess what, they're ours for three years and they don't get to go back. That's rewarding bad behavior. And selling them on, on the opposite that. in the process. I'm sorry, what? And selling them on the opposite. Yes. And finally, I'd like to echo the uh, comments of Supervisor Mir Karimi with regard to generation costs. All of the utilities, uh, since competitive markets began in the late 90s, have been engaged in the ploy of trying to shift generation costs into transmission and distribution rates. When they do that, they accomplish several things. Uh, they, first of all, of course, reduce the generation costs for their own bundled customers so that by comparison, uh, bundled service looks preferable to engaging in competitive market. Um, more to the point, they burden and make it very difficult for other competitive providers, for community choice aggregators, to offer a competitive product. So it, it's clear that there needs to be some sort of statement in the law that basically prohibits this activity and gives the commission greater authority and ability to try to go after and attack these efforts to shift generation costs that should be paid by the utility's own customers 
to the customers of the New York. Now, PG&E can Canadian. only accomplish this shift with approval of the CPUC. Is that correct? Well, it, well, yes, that's true that the commission has to approve it, but uh, it's it's an issue that is ripe for obfuscation. Let's put it that way. <laughs> the CPUC, though, currently the commissioners have the authority to deny the request. They have the authority to deny requests uh, to the extent that they um, agree that the shift is in fact taking place. And what is the strong argument that pg e would be making to the commissioners that they would buy that would <coughs> authorize them to accomplish the shift? Well, frequently they make the argument that uh, the costs that are being incurred are costs that benefit all ratepayers, whether they are just bundled customers of the utility, or they are customers of, uh, or they are customers of other servers as well, including uh, CCA customers. Right. So they but try to use that as a justification for taking shifts, for taking costs that are really generation. But we've heard from Ms. Wise and others that the net effect of this shift, if it is approved, would be to make the CCA less competitive. So how does that benefit their customers? Well, it doesn't benefit PG&E's customers. It benefits PG&E, the utility. I understand that, but so it would be counterintuitive for the commission to buy this faulty argument. <laughs> yeah. I'll let Mr. Clannon respond. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure Mr. I see Clannon a letter from Senator Leno coming. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. At, at any rate. Um, that, that concludes my remarks, Senator. Thank you very much for the opportunity to appear today. And we thank you very much for being with us, Mr. Douglas, for all your good work on behalf of those who fight monopolies. And Mr. Clannon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. As one who professionally uh, fights monopolies as well, I thank you for the cleanup, for the cleanup position. Um, the panelists who've spoken before me, both on the first panel and also on this one, I think have laid out the history actually very well. I, I don't really need to go over that history anymore, um, and I know that you've got some topics that you want to focus in on. So let me just frame that a little bit by giving a little bit of perspective from, uh, from the trenches at the PUC about what we hear, what we've done, what the results look like from, from our perspective. I'd say they're highly mixed. I would say that the implementation of AB 117 has been very rocky, both in San Joaquin, especially in Marin, and uh, I wish I were more confident that the implementation of AB 117 in San Francisco uh, will go smoothly than I am as of today. Um, what have we done? So beginning in 2007, in the development of the, of the CCA proposal in San Joaquin, it's the San Joaquin Valley, and Mr. Ork laid that out very well, uh, I would characterize the Commission's involvement there and the Commission's intervention as very formal. It was the use of the PUC's very formal tools, um, proceedings, uh, negotiations, ultimately settlements that the Commission considered. And we resolved a bunch of uh, issues that way. I really applaud San Joaquin for being first out of the gate. Uh, they raised a lot of the issues, uh, a lot of issues that the commission and San Joaquin were able to resolve back then um, that did not come back to plague uh, their successors. Other things did, and I'll get to those in a minute. The great advantage of using those formal processes is everybody gets heard, the force of law is behind the commission's decision in those formal processes, things get resolved, and they are resolved. And, that was a great advantage. The great disadvantage is what Mr. Ward said. It took too long. It takes too many resources to participate in those kinds of proceedings. There are very good reasons why those proceedings take a while. Everybody needs to be heard. The commission is required to, do, uh, to make its decisions after adequate due process. Very good reasons for that, but it does come with a cost in time and in resources. And nobody on either of these two panels, you know, we're all public employees or you know, public employees once removed in this whole process. Nobody has the resources to get every decision resolved in that way. Then we come to 2009 and the beginnings of the uh, marketing efforts, the counter-marketing efforts by both MEA um, and, and by PG&E. It hasn't been talked about much here, a little bit, um, that there's been a lot of informal involvement at the Public Utilities Commission. I first met Ms. Wise uh, in the context of the PUC staff mediating a uh, series of disputes between PG&E and MEA around the servicing agreement, around some sort of basic definitions of who can say what, who can call whom, and so on. Uh, that was a difficult negotiation. pg e has not made any part of implementing AB 117 easy, and I don't expect them to change that. I think Mr. Douglas is exactly right, um, and I'm gonna come back to motivation here in a minute. 
Um, as a result of that mediation, which took a lot of time at the staff level and a lot of resources um, that the ratepayers are paying for among my staff in my own time, we got a lot of things resolved and we moved forward. Uh, then we get to marketing. Now, um, marketing's been talked about a little bit here, but I think it's important to, to realize how that was um, presented to the Public Utilities Commission. It was really presented in two ways. The first was the mailers that Don held up. I get those same mailers in my house in San Francisco, by the way. Uh, I got plenty of copies of those mailers. Where those mailers were untrue or misleading about the opt-in process and the opt-out process, we took immediate action. I sent letters to PG&E saying knock it off uh, and threatening them with fines and sanctions. Then they did knock off that particular thing and moved on to another tactic. And the, the next tactic was really marketing generally. Uh, marketing PG&E as a green provider, marketing PG&E as, as a utility that people have trusted to be a provider of utility service for a long time. It was controversial at the commission level among the commissioners at the PUC about the ability under statute, both AB 117 and broader statutes of the PUC, to be able to regulate the commercial speech of PG&E in this area. And where the commissioners ultimately came down was, um, was establishing a standard that any marketing by PG&E, any exercise of that commercial free speech by PG&E in this area couldn't be untrue or misleading. Uh, I have to say, it shouldn't be controversial uh, for the PUC to establish that, but it was. Uh, we did establish that, P, that, that PG&E marketing efforts can't be untrue or misleading, and establish an expedited way for CCAs like Moran, like Clean Power SF, to bring us uh, examples of utility, not just PG&E, but anybody else, of utility marketing that's untrue or misleading, we established a very expedited way for the PUC to tell the utility to knock it off, not just by the executive director sending a letter, but through an order by a judge uh, that would have the teeth of fines and sanctions behind it if the, if the utility uh, continued. So uh, we, we, we learned some things in the San Joaquin Valley process and, 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 and settled some questions. I would say from the PUC intervention perspective, the big move forward that we made as a result of Marin was that, that we've now established an expedited way using the fines and sanctions authority of the PUC so that CCAs, wherever they might be, Clean Power SF and others that come up, can use the, the PUC's fines and sanctions process uh, to go after a utility that is being untrue or misleading. Mr. Kleiner, what have been the fines and the sanctions that have resulted in the egregious acts of pg e which have been documented over and over and over and over again, despite your telling them to stop. Yeah, so Have I there been any fines or sanctions? So I told them to stop in, in, uh, in May, and in May the commissioners also established this expedited process. Since then, no CCA has brought a complaint under that expedited process. I, I say to the CCAs here in this room that that process is cheap and fast. Uh, you come to the PUC with a copy of the mailer in your hand, we evaluate it, and we take some action. Uh, PG&E, after my letters and after the establishment of that procedure, significantly reduced its marketing, as I think the folks here will tell you, um, and it had, that, it had that positive immediate effect. That tool is now there. It's got the fines and sanctions backing behind it, and I'm expecting it, A, you know, it, its purpose is not to collect fines and sanctions. Its purpose is to prevent that behavior to begin with, because as the folks in Marin also uh, have said here, and this is very clear, once uh, a, a potential customer or an actual customer gets in their head some wrong message from any side, it's very hard to get that out. Uh, it's very hard with good information to drive bad information out of the consumer space. And so it's important that, you know, what we're about here is not collecting fines and sanctions or slapping PG&E. What we're about is preventing that behavior from, from the beginning. A thought comes to mind. First of all, I think it's important that there be some fine some sanction, so they know if they do it again, it's not just going to be, they're not just going to be told to stop again, whether it's mailers or some other tactic. And as you said, they went on two other tactics, they just stopped the mailers. And is there currently, or might there be a facility so that the victim benefits from the fine, not the CPUC, but it goes back to Marin Energy Authority to cover some of their costs? Well, that gets me to some of the ideas for legislation that have been talked about on the two panels in. And I think that's an important one. So in current law, as you and I have discussed in another context recently, the commission has the authority uh, to order, uh, to levy fines on the utilities that we regulate. It's $20,000 per violation. A violation can be for a continuing action every day 
Uh, and people could argue that any, ma any individual mailer that was unsure or misleading was an individual violation. So those dollars could rack up fast um, and, uh, as fines. The, le the current legislation and long-standing legislation does not permit the PUC to award damages to anyone who was, uh, who was the victim in your, in your lexicon there of the behavior. Instead, those fines monies go to, go to the general fund. And, uh, and you know very well that once they go to the general fund, they don't come back out again. Um, so that would take a change in legislation in order to permit the commission essentially to pay damages, to award damages to, to people who are, uh, who are victimized by this kind of behavior. Uh, another idea that's been talked about here in both panels, and Mr. Douglas alluded to it again, was, this, was the notion of a code of conduct and I, uh, for the utilities. I think that's a very attractive discussion for the legislature uh, to be having now. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate the ability to be in that discussion. I think um, despite the fact that words like fully cooperate are, are clear English and precise English, and you and I can agree on them uh, together, they're very difficult legal concepts to, uh, to, to enforce against highly sophisticated opponents uh, who will say, well, you know, yeah, we cooperated, we gave the appropriate billing information. Well, what's appropriate? And how do you determine that? And by the time, by the way, you've gone through all this process, whatever CCA that was is gone um, and, and got tired and left. So I think the notion of a code of conduct to help bring teeth into uh, and definition into things like fully cooperate would be, would be very useful to the commission in implementing this legislation. And I think it's worth, that's a discussion that is very much worth having and I appreciate the ability to be in it. Um, I know you've got questions that you want to ask, so I better just, just stop there as the time is late. But I, I, I want to say to the members of the public here, especially, um, that there is no sense of the Public Utilities Commission of defending PG&E or any other utility when it violates the law. We use the tools that we're given in the best possible way that we can. Um, if you knew the, uh, the many hours that I and the commissioners and the commission staff have spent uh, in, in doing the very best we can to implement AB 117, I think you would, uh, you would be uh, more encouraging of our, of our uh, attempt now to get some more clarity um, for the CCAs that follow the good work that the one here in Marin has, has, really, has really blazed, the trail that's been blazed here. Thank you, Mr. Clyde. We appreciate your being here and also your constructive suggestions as to how we might legislatively respond to all that's transpired in the past couple of years. Do you take any argument with Ms. Wise's comment that there was lobbying occurring here in Marin County in opposition to the creation of the Marin Energy Authority that was not on the shareholder side of the utility. As again, you and I have discussed in another context, this, uh, the, the definition of shareholder money versus ratepayer money is both very simple and very complex. So I give you the simple answer, it's all ratepayer money. Uh, where PG&E gets its money is from the ratepayers. Um, and uh, to the extent then that we folks in the regulatory arena uh, draw distinctions between shareholder money and ratepayer money. I think for the members of the public, to a degree, that's veils. That's, that's a sh that can appear to be a shell game. Having said that, um, an individual PG&E employee can charge her time to, the sh to shareholder funded accounts or ratepayer funded accounts. Uh, it's commonly done. You actually have to get in with accountants and green eye shades uh, to, to get to the bottom of that sort of behavior. Uh, the energy division staff that's been talked about here a couple of times this morning uh, has done that and has looked uh, to make sure that PG&E is billing its time uh, appropriately, and I'm fairly confident that that went on. But, but you know, as I say again to the members of the public, it's all right there, money. Uh, you know, it comes from PG&E's customers ultimately. I would wholeheartedly agree with you, and, and different from other utilities, which you regulate, Comcast, AT&T, which have a variety of revenue streams and sources, PG&E has exactly one. It is ratepayer, it's all ratepayer. Without it, there is no shareholder money. So I don't know how we get to the bottom of that because this is an issue that continues to arise. Both the interference that we experienced in Marin County, that which we experienced in San Joaquin, which we are already announcing we expect to experience in San Francisco County, and then of course the huge sums of money that were spent in support of Prop 16. A completely PGE initiated, implemented, there was no grassroots anything. It was all for one purpose, by one perpetrator. Uh, and it, my, it, my mailbox filled up at the same time yours yeah. did, yeah. And then to claim that it was shareholder money, but, and I understand the, the, the fine points of it as well, but it, it, 
definitely concerns me that my ratepayer dollars were used to print outright knowledge lies that with the purpose of which was to encourage opt-outs. Just something wrong with that. Uh, with regards to um, Mr. Douglas's comment that the phone banks that they set up, again, in the one other effort to encourage the opt-outs, made a mockery of state law. Pretty strong statement. Yeah, in my letter, and actually following up on earlier commission decisions following San Joaquin, following uh, earlier developments in Marin, the, the, the commission had laid out very clearly, you know, starting with the statute and then commission decisions, laying out very clearly how the opt-out process was to work. My, my first letter to PG&E in May cited that, that and said, knock it off, you don't get to do this. Uh, you don't get to, uh, to call up customers in Marin and try to get them to opt out. Uh, then they, well, when they got that letter, they stopped that particular thing. Um, and, and I guess we've gone down that path before. I'll, the other thing I'll say is that utility activities, uh, call centers, uh, marketing, uh, newspaper ads, I've seen the newspaper ads in the IJ that had a little coupon that looked right. like an opt-out coupon. Sure. It was not a lawful opt-out coupon. Uh, it wasn't supposed to happen that way. But that's what it looked like. Uh, I've also seen mailers that were um, on PG&E postcards, had the PG&E logo, but somewhere in there, you know, a little fine print that said this is not from a utility, but it sure as heck looked like it was from a utility, encouraging opt-outs and claiming to be opt-out information. All of those things are covered by the decision that the commissioners issued with this very fast temporary restraining order backed up by fines and sanctions um, back in May. All of those things are not there. So, uh, so any call center that starts operating in San Francisco, I expect an immediate call from Clean Power SF. If I get one of the calls, I can tell you I will start the process uh, immediately to make sure that that doesn't happen. Wouldn't it make sense, given that we have this clear vision of what is likely, this is like a storm coming in off the west coast, you know, the Pacific coast, right? It's about to hit the Bay Area. We see it coming. We, we can document it. We have no doubt of its arrival. Wouldn't some fines and sanctions now for what they've already done the mailers stop, okay. The phone calls stop, okay. The coupons in the newspapers stop, okay. They just, they're, they have endless opportunities for further nefarious creativity. Why would we not want to say, okay, $20,000 a day and it starts here and it ends there? Maybe that would discourage that storm from arriving off the Pacific Coast. Yeah, I, I, I take that. I take the point and for a phone call, yeah. Uh, and by the way, I'm just repeating something from the crowd. For a phone call, you know, the definition of a violation is is under that statute uh, in the hands. Might we get their attention? Because we haven't gotten it yet. Yeah, I, I take your point, and I know it's a discussion that you've had with, with PUC commissioners as well. I don't have any argument against that, except to say that you know that that's a, a choice about how you get the right behavior. Um, and you know that's a perfectly valid choice. I, I said earlier that I wanted to say just a quick word about motivation. We're a regulatory body. We are very good at determining a fact and then taking action based on that fact. I can determine very clearly who sent the mailer, what the mailer says. I can even conclude- And it was illegal. I can even conclude pretty well that it's misleading or untrue and therefore illegal. Um, very difficult for me to, to determine motivation. And utilities are sophisticated about then finding some other behavior um, that, that satisfies their motivation. So, I mean, I do caution everyone involved here in the notion that fines and sanctions or very precise rules or, uh, or anything of that nature is going to stop the motivation. Um, it's, a, it's a thing that I've worked on professionally for 26 years now. I can tell you it's very difficult to get right. And just so I understand better the operations of, of your office and of your commission, a fine or a sanction is initiated by staff and put before the commissioners for a vote. That's right. So you are in complete authority today to be able to put 20,000, 40,000, or 20,000 times 100 before the commission to say, we think all, we know all this has happened, we've determined this has happened, we think this is an appropriate sanction, and we also, in putting this before you commissioners, are hopeful that with your support, we will preempt this from ever happening again, specifically 
as San Francisco is proceeding with its own efforts to establish a community choice aggregation. I understand the desire to do that, and, and it is a tool in the, in the, tool, in the toolbox. Uh, you know that there are a lot of things competing for, for commission staff's attention. Uh, the explosion in San Bruno is, uh, is, is competing for a lot of my attention and the attention of the UC enforcement staff, for example. Uh, those are choices that we, public employees with limited budgets, are making all the time about where to put, uh, what's the best way to send the message that it won't be tolerated. I would guarantee you, sit on the budget conference committee, <laughs> if you were to put $10 million in the general fund as a result of some of these fines, you would see it for your staff budget. <laughs> there may be a letter from you to do that. <laughs> I very much appreciate your support, and I think this hearing is raising the right questions. All right. We're almost a half hour over, and I'm <coughs> appreciative of everyone sticking with us, and also for the city of San Rafael for not kicking us out. Uh, uh, Supervisor Glass, you had a comment. Senator, I just wanted to let you know that were it of interest to the commission, the Marine Energy Authority could quantify the damages that were caused I by... I bet you could. <laughs> And I guess what I wanted to point out that there is a larger public policy issue at play as well in that the taxpayers of Marin County through a loan guarantee from the County Board of Supervisors had to provide funding to deal with the illegal marketing activities and that is funding that would have otherwise been used here locally to more expeditiously pursue energy efficiency programs. We are right now in the press being accused of going too slow on those efforts and uh, the reason we can't execute them in as large a scale as we desire. We have authorized a feed-in tariff program, we have an attractive net metering program, we have a grant program for our electric vehicle charging stations, but there's more we could have done. And those resources were diverted into an incredibly unproductive marketing war and time spent with attorneys at the commission to deal with the antics. And so the larger public policy concern, I think, is relevant for the legislature in that CCAs are harmed in their ability to execute good public policy interventions that the people desire. I can't state more clearly than that. Supervisor. Uh, just real quickly, it has already begun in San Francisco. So the disinformation and the attempt to preempt our ability to pursue a CCA, we have already seen those tactics, so in case that that was misunderstood. I wanted to make sure for the record. So we would as well, I think, be a candidate for uh, restitution. Uh, if the CPUC uh, sees so fit to pursue, I think, the uh, grievances we would have against PG&E by the mailers that have blanketed the city and county of San Francisco and by the well-paid tactics already, just to try to handicap us from even getting beyond the embryonic stage. Uh, and the other thing is that what hasn't been said, at least not that I heard, is that for those um, who are not going to meet the renewable uh, standards, uh, why are there not uh, strong penalties attached uh, for that PGE uh, who's already been uh, well, uh, I think, transparent about the idea that they're not going to meet these standards? Why is it then that we in the CCA front, again, a not for profit, organic, uh, construct that we are then trying to rise to a particular standard occasion that the private utilities already said that they cannot and they're not even being held uh, to uh, comply. It's a good point that you make and also just to remind everyone that though we were unsuccessful and Senator Smithian showed great leadership in his legislative efforts to put into statute a higher renewable portfolio standard than we currently have today, the 20% by 2010, but 33% by 2020, that the governor did put that into place as an executive order, and I would imagine that our new governor is not likely to change that. So the idea is to get it even higher, give them a little more time, because they clearly were struggling to get even to the 2010 standard of 20%. Uh, we have to get out here in just a few minutes. We also have to allow for some public comment. So I want to thank you, Mr. Brennan, for your forthright comments, and Ms. Miller and Mr. Douglas for your assistance today as well. And supervisors, we would not be here today if it weren't for each of your leadership. So thank you very much. And continued success. Thank you.
Can I see a show of hands, please, just so I can see how many? We have at least a couple, three, four, five. Have I got six? All right, so if we could keep it to about two minutes each so that we're out of here in time for the city to prepare for the next use of this room, which is in just 30 minutes. Thank two you. minutes? How much do you want? How much? A couple minutes. Two minutes, okay. Yes, thank you. Councilwoman, welcome. Good afternoon, Senator Leno. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much for coming down here to have this very robust conversation. As you know, I serve as vice chair of the NEA. I'm also engaged with a number of people in this room um, looking at how we not only support existing CCAs, but expand them in the state of California because all, and, and frankly, in other states around the country that have CCAs. There are six of us uh, currently. So, um, because none of these benefits can be realized in terms of market expansion, greenhouse gas reduction, economic and workforce development, that happens with economies of scale, as you know uh, better than anybody. So, the first thing I'd love to say is, you know, I think we need to level the financial playing field here. Um, the discussions here about fines and sanctions make a ton of sense to me because it's all nice to get a letter and a slap on the wrist, but you know, in the end, we need to hit pg &E where it hurts, and that's in the pocketbook. And if you can't figure out a way to have remuneration back to the individual agencies, which on behalf of MEA, I can say, we can figure out to the dollar exactly what all of these tactics have cost us. That uh, Our staff has run great analysis. Um, it would be great then maybe to look at funding a regulatory and legal defense fund so that there is a way to begin to offset some of these expenses that bleed us to death while the due process is happening. So that may be a way to do it that uh, provides some kind of a, a compromise on the issue. Um, I also think we need to re-engage the California Energy Commission on this issue. Um, they've done fabulous work in the past. They're doing great things with energy efficiency right now. But in truth, you know, talk to any of those folks, uh, CCA is, is not a, an acronym that you talk a lot about now at CEC. And it's a critical partner to get back on board on this issue. Um, last but not least, I think we need to figure out, maybe with some of the state's help, funding, additional funding um, avenues to incentivize new CCAs, because we've talked a lot about PG&E's tactics. Another humongous barrier is gonna be the couple million dollars it takes to get these from planning to ratepayer revenue. And uh, right now, as you know, cities and counties don't have it. And so I'm not suggesting that the state does either, by the way. But um, that perhaps we can all work together to figure out where pockets of money exist and how the flow can begin to open back up to CCA. Um, secondly, we need more of you. The other thing we've got to have, in addition to the Charles McGlashans and Ross Mercremies, is greater leadership at the state level. And I think your colleagues need to understand that this is not just about renewables and greenhouse gas, which is utterly fantastic and a number one reason to do it, but it also has a bottom line impact on local economic development and jobs, jobs, jobs. So every time PG&E is allowed to get away with this stuff, they're thwarting jobs creation in our communities. That takes the pressure off the state to then have to backfill all of these different um, economic development program. So it, it all goes in a closed loop, as you well know, and, and we've got to remember the economic piece of CCA and the value that it brings at home. Third, um, and specifically, uh, there are a couple <laughs> process adjustments to include or to think about expanding the gateway to CCA, shortening up the time from in implementation to, excuse me, from planning to implementation, which might mean that we do resolutions through city councils and keep it at the county level. That's something to look at, and uh, and I have more about affirmative marketing, marketing, but we can talk later. I look forward to it. Very well taken comments. Thank you, thanks, Marshall. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Senator Leno. Uh, my name is Barbara George, and I'm with Women's Energy Matters, and we have been um, ratepayer advocates at the California Public Utilities Commission since 2001. We specialized in the energy efficiency proceedings. Um, but we were also in the general rate case for PG&E this year. We've been in procurement proceedings, and we get to that in a minute. I was also um, a citizen lobbyist when I lived in Sacramento in 2002, and I um, helped lobby for this bill. So I'm, I'm very close to um, what is happening here, and the energy efficiency in particular in the bill is what I was specializing in. Um, so I'm currently in a proceeding where they are looking at 
um, the misuse of energy efficiency funds to fight CTAs, um, but they're also looking at the CTA um, opportunities to, um, to use energy efficiency funds, and I'm very happy about that. It's a very compressible piece of the proceeding, so I'm not sure exactly um, what it's gonna look like. Um, but I think that there are important things that we need to have your help on. Um, one of the things that Women's Energy Matters filed um, a year ago was an application for rehearing of the current um, energy efficiency portfolios decision. And we said PG&E um, is able to misuse these energy efficiency funds um, at will in the back room, you know, in the front room before city councils. We have videos on our website of the misuse of energy efficiency funds in Novato, which was the subject of the resolution that the commission uh, did pass. But in the general rate case, um, the, the PG&E witnesses said they paid no attention to that um, resolution or the, the um, energy efficiency um, decision which said that they should not interfere with um, CTAs. And they said, oh, well, you know, we were just giving information about energy efficiency. We weren't, um, you know, even though the letter said this is an alternative to CTAs. So, so they said this doesn't apply to us and that's why we didn't have to do anything about it. Now, the PG&E has 270 account managers, and so in the GRC hearings, the only evidentiary hearings that have been held that, you know, that we were able to get these questions out, um, we said, um, can, can all of your account representatives, all 270 of them, plus their lawyers and their, you know, regulatory affairs and their public affairs people, can they all talk about CCA in the same meeting where they talk about energy efficiency, where they make these offers? And we also, and they said yes. So Joe, you're gonna have to conclude. I will. And they also said that they could discuss Prop 16. They claimed that they did um, did that below the line. We actually helped to re um, rewrite some of the be, be below the line policy in the general rate case, but it has a long way to go. And believe me, it was not sufficient last year to prevent the misuse of a billion dollars of energy efficiency funds to fight <coughs> energy choice. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and for your advocacy. So we're, we're asking the commission to, and, and you to take PG&E's control of energy efficiency away from them, at least while CCAs are in formation for the next three years. Thank you, Ms. George. Senator Leno, uh, my name is Ed Mainland. I'm uh, co-chair of the Sierra Club California's Energy Climate Committee. Uh, we're about 90-some 90, 90 uh, energy activists up and down the state. and. Uh, I live in Nevada, and I was actually in the room uh, in a public meeting where a senior PG&E executive uh, made the ploy to the city of Nevada's uh, several city council members uh, that they would like to offer an alternative to the CCA uh, in the form of basically uh, existing uh, energy efficiency programs uh, funded by ratepayers. Uh, so, uh, fortunately, this episode was videotaped, and uh, so my suggestion to the CPUC would be for the CPUC to put the videotape uh, up on the CPUC website uh, with a big uh, verboten label. In other words, uh, this is not allowed, uh, this is a misuse of uh, ratepayers' money. Uh, however, uh, Ms., uh, Senator Leno, I have an article here for the record I'd like to submit. It's uh, by two uh, Sierra Club members. It was published in the uh, Desert Report of uh, Sierra Club in September. And uh, what it does is lay out decentralized renewable power, its benefits, and how to get there. And uh, certainly CCA is the most powerful tool getting there. And uh, so I'd like to submit that. Also, I'd like to submit the testimony of Sierra Club California. Uh, in the uh, uh, general rate case, uh, uh, proceeding phase two, uh, in which Sierra Club in great detail uh, deconstructs uh, PG&E's uh, ploy of uh, uh, shifting, uh, uh, shifting charges to the transmission side. And uh, I hope that would be useful to you. It, it has a great deal of detail on that. Finally, uh, if I might say that uh, uh, PG&E has used the threat of CEQA litigation uh, to try to uh, frighten local officials. I don't know the legislative or the regulatory remedy for this threat, uh, but just in common sense, 
uh, it's preposterous uh, for CEQA to be deployed against a plan, not a project, but a plan uh, that promises to do more for greenhouse gas reduction uh, than any other single means. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayland. Our last two speakers. Welcome. Thank you again, uh, uh, Senator Leno, for holding this uh, hearing. My name is Al Weinrup. I'm representing here the uh, Local Clean Energy Alliance, which is an organization of about 60 groups. Uh, it's a Bay Area organization, mostly based in the East Bay. Uh, so I am quite familiar with uh, Oakland and Berkeley's efforts around uh, CCA. I've been to hearings and council meetings and so on and so forth. And it's very clear that uh, those, those two cities, at least, are very, very shy and uh, not willing to take a step forward. Uh, because of everything that you've heard about uh, today, the financial barriers, the political barriers, it's like a huge, it's like a huge mountain. So uh, the CPUC is really too little, too late in all cases every time uh, to be of any, uh, any kind of reassurance to our communities. Uh, what's needed uh, in terms of the state, uh, since there's so much at stake for the state, uh, I mean, I, I want to just second what Sean Marshall said and what Ed, Ed Mainland talked about that local, Renewable power generation is, is like a crucial, uh, a crucial need of all our communities economically for jobs and everything else. And CCA is a vital uh, mechanism for being able to accomplish that. So what we need is uh, help from the state so that individual communities are not taking this on individually, which means some kind of legislation which uh, uh, actually sets up a state advocacy agency for CCA formation in different communities so that these battles are not fought individually by individual municipalities and communities, but there's actually a state agency to go to bat for them that can be the representative to try to force the CPUC to do the right kind of thing. So that's what we need. We really need the kind of support so that individual communities don't have to take this on themselves all the time, one on one, and seeing the death, you know, and especially with the devastation they see behind yeah. Thanks very much. Appreciate you, your Mr. efforts. Yeah. Mr. Weinberg. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Richard Cohen. I'm a private citizen. I'm a professional in the power engineering field. And I'm, I've been working with Marine Clean Energy for several years now. I wanted to uh, emphasize something that Dawn said about how pg e is basically a reckless and uncontrolled and uncontrollable uh, hazard rolling, rolling around. Uh, and if you look back at the record, it's not just their attacking green clean energy, and it's not just their uh, some of the other minor things that they're being uh, misuse of energy fund, of energy efficiency funds that they are being accused of here. If you look at the San Bruno disaster, you see which now is being called an incident. By the way, it's a disaster. Okay. Uh, if you look back, you will see that. Two years before that, there was a somewhat similar incident in Sacramento, which, which itself had been preceded a year by a, uh, a something that nearly happened, that nearly the same thing happened. And they were supposed to be surveying that Rancho Cordova property and sites and plumbing and so on. They didn't do it. And the San Bruno <coughs> stuff, they had been for two years supposed to be studying all those pipes and demonstrating their uh, robustness and appropriateness. And they uh, somehow managed to find $15 billion for executive bonuses during that two year period, but they didn't find the money to survey the pipes under San Bruno. Now, this is not an appropriate item for oral discussion. I am going to write up an incident, a, an incident report, so to speak, that goes back about 30 years send you each a copy. There are terrible, terrible things in this history that have been lost, including, of course, the bankruptcy. The most expensive of all, the bankruptcy, uh, which has been laid off on, on the state. Uh, but I will put together a list of these things that will show you that PG&E is just a rapacious and uh, limitless uh, <laughs> taker, shall I call it, of, of the situation. Think about is getting a new president and maybe divestiture in the 
same way that AT&T was divided up. I wasn't AT&T employee at the time, but I'm sure I've seen this stuff going on from the inside. Um, thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Cott. I look forward to get your incident report to both of you. The last word. Yes, thank you, Senator Leonard. My name is Charlie Smith, and my electric bill runs a thousand a month. And I rent rooms in my house to basically disabled and you know, both mentally and physically disabled people, and I put a solar system on. Still, uh, I'm paying, the true up period is about $6,000. So I would pr request that you give some consideration to the uh, cutting of the highest rate for those that extend services to people that have to live around the house all the time. That's part of it. And I've done everything I could, put, put uh, windows in and you know, done everything I could to uh, lower my bill. But people that are older need more power than those that are younger and are gone all day. So, so therefore, I think consideration should be given in this area of uh, public service that those of us who choose to do that are given a little cut on the highest rate. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I want to thank everyone for joining us and sticking with us through the entirety of the hearing. I think we touched on any number of important issues and points and came out with some very constructive suggestions as well. And you can be certain that I and my office are committed to moving forward some of the suggestions today, assisting the CPUC in their oversight of pg and &E and of the other investor-owned utilities and to make sure that we do everything within our power to not allow that which has occurred in San Joaquin and in Marin to occur yet again in San Francisco. We can see it coming, there's no doubt of it. We know the games that are played we shouldn't be game yet again. So I also want to thank our sergeants who have come from Sacramento to help facilitate our out of Sacramento hearing and to uh, express our thanks to the President Pro Tem who uh, allows for the formation of these select committees so that we can come to our communities and talk about issues of importance to our constituents. We are adjourned.